at the moment, we're doing 21 mashes a week. As Sean said, 4.5 tonnes, but it's high gravity mashing. It's about 19,000 litres um, per washback. Yeah, that's what we're doing just now. Yeah. And as I said already, in a perfect world, 1.8 million litres would be uh, the magic number uh, for here. So I'm doing my best. Okay, obviously that used to be the kiln uh, once upon a time. That now just houses like yeast tanks, heating tanks, the more industrial uh, side of things. Okay. This is going to be kind of a whistle stop tour, I'm sorry. I know. Uh, I've got a tendency to talk way too much, so Samantha will stand up there and go, <laughs> as, as she usually does. Okay. This is malt storage. Um, behind you, you see 10 bins of 30 tonnes uh, in each. So it's one Arctic lorry for one bin, 30 tonnes. So 300 tonnes at one time I can hold here. And that is a luxury for such a small distillery. But back in 1981, when this was still under Allied uh, umbrella, uh, there were plans for Balware to expand. And this was phase one, uh, put in 10 bins. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, uh, they decided to shell uh, the rest of the developments. So, yeah. I don't know if the other thing is, you would think whiskey still if you move for, to be close to the railway line, yeah. that door, if you walk out, that's the railway line. I mean, literally two metres yeah. outside that door is the main railway line. So, uh, that is a fire escape, but there is a barrier there, okay? Yeah. Before anybody picks up on it. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, that's the railway line, so uh, just to give you an idea of the proximity. Yeah. The water source for Balplayer, when you leave the distillery and if you look straight ahead of you, you'll see a hill line covered in forestry and scrubland. Well, the source of our water is about six miles into the hill, and we have sole right to that water. Uh, we have grandfather rights going back 1790 and probably even before that. And that satisfies all our production and all our cooling. Uh, at the moment, we're sitting at 14.2 litres water uh, per alcohol. So we're way under um, you know, industry um, levels. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's those numbers that we discussed last night, the SWA said the benchmark is 12 and a half litres up to 25. So that's the range that they want you to be in, and they think that's a good distillery. So I've worked with distilleries with 27 plus. Uh, member House Group, or the International Beverage Group, sorry, we are sitting around 14.4 for the entire group, so there's some that are slightly higher, so as an example, but when it used to see later on today, we are sitting about 17. There's some stuff happening for America in the last week, which we discussed when we get there, which is driven, driven that number right down. So if you look at International Beverage Group, we are doing really, really well. We're sitting at 14 and a half for the entire group, it's really, really outstanding. And there's just that push. My commitment and challenge is that we will be better than the SWA guidance of 12.5. We will be 12.5 before the end of the next financial year. There's some innovation we're doing to try and drive it down, so we will be there. At one side, we're absolutely going to beat it before the end of the week. So, <laughs> so it's 14.2, 14.2. Which is really, really good, and I have got other engines there, sorry, other companies we delighted that. So very nice and very just just holes in that to our next one. I found really good things in our first round of business, how well we've actually done it. And if we benefit from being re-joining re the business. And I think also with old sites, these are more modern distilleries. I think that's the other thing. You know, that's what I wanted to say when we talked about it last night. You know, actually it's not by building lots of brand new distilleries that we're doing all this. It's by actually being an interesting mix of new technologies with traditional methods so you know and as you say it's range from 12 to 25 we're in total group at 14 point, and we're going to be not only in the, their range we're going to be below their range yeah, yeah. of the SWA which will be pretty impressive for five sites of which the youngest is 125 years old it's challenging obviously but we'll be there but you'd be no, bored if it wasn't for that you know yeah. it's be that low already it's, yeah it's new and impressive it's, my ambition, I, I've done the maths and Tim might be able to correct me in this one. I think if you look at innovation and what we can do with maybe 
water, whether it be from pot ale or spendies and washing waters. My belief is that you can get as low as, for every one litre of alcohol produced, you can get as low as three litres. Now, that's difficult and there's a challenge in there, but you can get, so if you look at what's sitting at 14 just now, if we can get to sub 10, that's groundbreaking and really, really good. My belief is that you can get to three litres of water consumed for every one litre of alcohol. And that's, that's groundbreaking for the industry because, like I say, energy should should us, soon water will be equally as important, if not more so. And, and apart from the, it being the right thing to do and being SWA guidelines, is, are there, will there be penalties for people who don't make it or non, so, non SWA members who say, ah, oh, well, you know, we're all about there is, there is, process? There is nothing just now, but you look at it on the basis of it's the right thing you do for the environment, it's the right yeah. thing you do for the legacy we leave behind so the children that we have coming, the grandchildren that have coming, it's just the right thing morally to do. Yeah. You can say that about energy, and so I think water will go the same. If I was honest, I think CEPA will eventually put in legislation, infraction, or laws that say if you're not below X amount, then you're going to pay or you don't get a license to operate. I yeah. think it'll go that way because of how important that is. Yeah. I was at an SWA meeting recently and people were yeah. saying, you know, they, they, I think people wrongly feel that we're in Scotland and therefore water just, you know, how can Scotland have a water problem? But actually, we talked last night with Malcolm and Pulteney, we've had a distillery there for nearly 200 years with no problem except for the last two years where we've had to stop production. So I actually have been at some meetings, some industry meetings, where people say, oh, look, water's not an issue. I think that's absolutely wrong. I think water's going to be an issue in Scotland just as much as it is in other parts of the world. So it's the right thing to do. And legislation and consumer demand requirements will drive that behavior anyway. We just want to be there miles before it becomes legislation. Okay guys, this is the mash house, two grist bins, and a little competition. Does anybody know what that stands for? MP. MP. It's empty. The battle terminal gets the yeah. Good man. <laughs> empty. You guys have done this before, you have. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a mash done. Stainless steel, semi louter, and it's a three water mash. And we do here first water circa 65 degrees, second water 82, third water 92. First and second water being used for fermentation, third water being recycled, so three becomes one next mash. Okay, but four and a half tons takes us six and a half hours to process. So it's a long time to do you know, a fairly small mash. And, you know, I don't need to tell you guys, I know there's other places that can do 12 tonnes you know, in under three hours. But what we achieve here is a very tall mash bed. So it's very intense filtration uh, through the plates. So we get a very, very clear, bright wort. You know, if you took a sample of wort, you see your hand through it. And it gives us unbelievable fermentation. When I open one of these washbacks up and you have a nose in there, it is just the most amazing aroma coming off there. Okay, byproduct draft. We will sell that, sell that to local farmers. That will become their animal feed. So every six and a half hours or so, you'll see a tractor and trailer come down here and take away a load of draft. Okay, questions? No. Oh. How long is the drainage take then? Well, the entire mash is six and a half. Six, six and a half, six and a half hours, hours, yeah. So actually, the temperatures of the three washes it gets. 65, 82, 92. It's really intense. The smell is really intense. It's fantastic. fantastic. I've never smelled washbacks quite like no. what we have here. I agree. Okay. 
come in a bit guys okay this is the turn room in here you'll see six traditional wooden washbacks uh, all Oregon pine um, 19,000 litres uh, per washback and average fermentation time here is 60 hours uh, at the moment so two and a half days uh, fermentation okay I'm waiting for you guys to ask me questions <laughs> they always have been wooden washbacks here and well, we'll, we'll talk about this Sean I'm a lot older than Sean, I'm more a traditionalist. Yeah. I believe that you can achieve the same thing CO2 levels just slightly higher here. Okay. So you can, you can there, okay. Right, because of that alarm, we're not going to stay in here much longer. Okay. But if you follow me out, I have a nose inside that washback, okay? Yeah. If I could put that in a can and sell it, I'd be rich. Yeah. 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 Have you experimented with other types of yeast or are you happy with that? I, I did when I started here. Um, we used to use pressed yeast before. Mm -hmm. Then we trialled a few liquids. I even did a trial with dried yeast, but I wasn't convinced uh, with dried yeast. Not because it didn't work, uh, it was because of profile, flavour yeah. profile. Because um, you could definitely notice it um, in the new make. So I cast that separately from right. everything else. I, I don't wear that too much in here. <laughs> yeah, Darcy comes in the summer. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, in the summer it must be absolutely sweating in here. Oh. Fierce. Yeah. And you've got like, nothing really to open up, do you? There's a couple of. The, 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 like, there are roof lights right above us, oh, okay. uh, vents. Even so. Yeah. They only make so much of a difference. Yeah. It's, uh, but the boys control the still house from up there, so. Yeah, it's fine. Used to be two guys yeah. until 2010. Used to be one master and one stillman. Um, but now it's one person does all. Yeah. It's seven days a week now. Seven days, yeah. 24-7. On what back, John? What's the case for the defence, as far as you're concerned? Is confusing pine rather than steel. Do you think it changed the character? Yeah, it, it was talked about. Uh, they were all replaced in 2002, all of them at once. And it was talked about then to replace them all with stainless steel. Yeah. But my predecessor, Derek Sinclair, um, he fought his case, he says, well, you're taking an enormous risk to change these to stainless steel. You could alter that fermentation profile mm. and hence something very different coming through the spirit state. So the accountant said, okay, 
you can change them, replacing all of them with more pine, I guess. Yeah. That yeah. would have changed things a little bit in the short term, didn't it? They did take time to bed in, yeah. Yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Normally you would not change everything at once, I would imagine. No. Yeah, but, but it had to be that the old ones were in quite a bit of disrepair, they were yeah. leaking quite badly, so they had to be done at once. When you talk about sustainability, back then in 2002, the washbacks that were replaced then were donated to the Finthorn Foundation uh, in Murray. So if you visit the Finthorn Foundation, you can go and live in a Bar Blair washback, <laughs> uh, if you wish. <laughs> nice aroma. <laughs> you see about the, the layout here, it really is old style, kind of cram everything in. And everything has been shoehorned in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's driven by the where the warehouse is now set and the railway line and yeah. so on. Yeah. To do anything in it, it, in it of an Esther story, we can't do it in this bit, we need to do it in our warehouses. Because everything is so tight. So when we get to the back, this site is one of the only sites, it's the only site that we don't have one term. This is just condensers. So when we get to the back here, we can talk briefly about thermal vapor recompression because in June of this year, August, June, July, August, we will replace these condensers and that entire system out the back with TVR. So we can discuss it out there, yeah, but that's what we'll do. All of this, will be, so the stills will remain the same, but the condensation system out the back will be completely changed. Now, it won't impact quality or character, because all we'll do is we'll recover the waste heat from that condenser in a slightly different way and reuse it in the process for the bin. So condensing will still happen the same, it'll still start in the same time frame, but what will happen is the waste energy from there we will reclaim in new years. Which means that we'll get less reliance on fossil fuels at that point. Hmm. Okay. You see two stills in here. One wash still, one spirit. One wash back per one charge of the wash still. That will run for about four and a half to five hours. I don't know what the timing will be when it's PBR. Sean? So, TVR, you can shorten the time frame slightly with TVR. We have no driver to change um, the, the condensing time. Our reality is the wash packs are the rate determining step, so the still house is under no pressure to run any faster, so we won't look to change it. Okay. You could change it for energy reasons, you could shorten your still runs. There's no business driver for that just now. Okay. The spirit still. Initial strength on four shots is about 75%. Once we go on to spirit, we'll slow the still right down, run it very, very slowly. We'll then stay on spirit for three hours. Cut point is 60%. As you all know, below 60% for here, you begin to detect off notes. You know, it becomes fainty. So it's obviously something we don't want in our end product. Once we do go on to faints, We'll take that down to 1.5%, and that's when distillation ceases. So you're looking about 1,750 litres of alcohol per run of the spirit still. Enough to fill probably 16 American oak barrels. Is that, is that been the, the process since you joined? It's not changed? It's been tweaked. Yeah? Slightly. So what have you done to tweak it? Uh, raise that cut point. Yeah. It used to be down to like 58, but it went to 60. Just oh, to make it. Just keep it slightly cleaner? Or? Yeah. yeah. High gravity mashing yeah. also impacts um, alcohol strain. So what you'll find is that John's alcohol strain here would have been about 68, 68.5, 68.5 alcohol by volume would be what you were producing off yourself. When you go to high gravity mashing, it increases it slightly, it just makes your alcohol slightly more concentrated, so we're probably off at 69.2, 692. yeah. So you do see that increase, but it doesn't... The wash point's higher, the wash point's higher. It's just... They're getting that higher concentration of alcohol from the higher point anyway. So which style of new make are you aiming for? The style? The flavour profile. I'll show you once we get back. Yeah. We'll do a tasting. I'll get some new make and we can share it around. It's fantastic. Fantastic new make. 
I never recommend drinking here, mate, but I knew you I know you guys always liked it. Oh, I, mean, I just don't recommend it. <laughs> Entire lot to you. It's recent. Oh it's definitely recent. Um depends what part of the still you're talking <laughs> about. Um in my time we've never replaced a whole complete still. The boil pot, the wash still has been replaced. Uh, the neck of the spirit still obviously. Yeah. yeah. Older. The see, old the old neck you see outside uh, in the yard. Yeah. That used to sit on top of that spirit oh, still. Yeah. I always find it super interesting when people ask about the stills. Because I, I use the analogy of Trigger's broom and um, <laughs> only fools and horses. Yeah, yeah. I've had this broom for fifty years, <laughs> but I've replaced the handle, replaced the head. It's exactly the same. Our, our copper runs out and um, we do a thickness testing to check it, but when the distillery says, oh, those are the original stills, my argument back would be they've obviously not been running very often because <laughs> the pure nature of alcohol production means that they wear. You're getting copper wear all the time, and that's one of your character flavour drivers. It's the interaction with copper, mm. how it interacts, how it oxidises. So anybody who says they've got an original still that they've never changed any parts, I've not produced a lot of alcohol. Put it this way, I've replaced each constituent part of those stills in my time here and the condensers as well. Is there any particular part of the process that you would say was absolutely key to Valblair and the character that you get? Or, or is it just that combination of all the different elements? That you all of the above. I would say, yeah. So if you change one thing, it's that same thing. If you change one little yeah. thing, it's going to impact the whole thing. But, you know, if we, if we decrease the fermentation time, you know, I can't see it happening, but if we went down to like something silly, you know, 45, 48 hours, that, that will change that. What, so what your fermentation times currently? Uh, average is 60. Do you have sort of the long and short mix or are they Not really. On five days we obviously had, well we're doing less production then, but it was seven short and seven long. The longs were getting, it was 103 hours they were getting something. Yeah. So I think 60 is perfect for here. Yeah. So this area will completely change. You see that this test hole's been dug, etc. So this is where we're going to make the investment. So what you need to imagine is these are traditional condensers. And um, so you've got a hot side and a cold side, vapor one side, cold water the other. And all you do is the vapor comes over from the stills, you pass cold water through it, you condense it, one pass, that's it done. The energy transfers from the vapor into the water. We reuse the water in some parts of the distillery, but pretty much that heat energy isn't being utilised. So, what we're going to do here is we will strip this entire part out. Everything you see here will be stripped out, and we will put in a new system called thermal vapour recompression. And all thermal vapour recompression does, and I'll keep it as simple as I possibly can, is it works on the Venturi effect. So, it's about changing pressure, changing speed of the heat source, and then decompressing it at the other side. So what happens is you have a PVR condenser which takes the, the vapour from the still and then it uses water that's cooling. But what happens if you have steam from your boiler house which is a fossil fuel but you can change that source. You pass it through a venturi and the motor force of the steam takes the waste energy from the condensed vapour transferring it into the water. You recompress that and then what it does is it superheats that water back up to be in steam again and you reuse that. And so what it does is this water that has 70 degrees probably and it's 60, 70 degrees recompresses that. As it recompresses you force a high pressure through the venturi and as you compress it, it heats up again, becomes superheated, pass it through the venturi, it comes out the other side and you have what's called superheated water which is close to steam but as you change the pressure it reverts back to steam and so at that point that energy is able to be reused because it's 60, 70, 80 degrees it's no use in the distillery you can't really do much with it and so we compress that back up to 120, 130 degrees and that reduces the reliance on steam from the boiler because if you think about a distillery 
Heat energy is everything that you need. Electricity is like 10% of what you need for a distillery. 90% of the energy you require in the distillery is heat to boil the it's big kettles. At the end of the day, that's all they are, big kettles. So you're boiling up the liquid, flashing off the alcohol, and that comes from this fossil fuel. So the reducer reliance on fossil fuel, innovative technology is what we're trying to do. TVR is one of them, and so it's just taking waste heat from here, recompressing it into being much hotter, and reusing it back into the uh, stills. So waste heat from the stills goes back into the stills, and that takes 40% out of your wash still. So what you need to think about is, it's only done in the wash still, you never do it in the spirit still. So you take 40% reuse of that energy out of your wash still, and you use that again in your distillation. So it's an actual reduction of 40% for your wash still, but when you do the maths across the piece, it's approximately 25 to 30% across your entire energy footprint. And it's doing nothing. It's just mechanical, you don't do anything different. It's there, so it's the thermal vapor, so the steam passes it through a venturi effect, and that's it. It's not super fancy, it's not really technical, it's simple, but it's cost effective and reduces your cost of fuel reliance. You do have something called mechanical vapor recompression, which is probably more efficient and a bit better, and when it works well, it's miraculous. <laughs> when it doesn't work so well, it's really problematic and expensive, but it relies hugely on it, so it takes a huge amount of electricity. So they're, doing, they're doing NVR, so yeah. mechanical vapor recompression. And all that is, is they have a massive turbine. And what you do is you take the low intensity heat out of your stills, you put it through a turbine which just compresses it. But the turbines are running like 7,000 RPM. It's like a turbocharger car. Uh, and all it does is it superheats it because it changes the pressure, superheats that energy, and then it fires the back already to be used. And that's all well and good. The way you need to think about a piece of equipment that's running at 7,000 RPMs, you get a tiny bit, so this is a, a wet process you need to think about, you get a tiny bit of vapour into that heat stream, and it's like hitting it with a machine gun. <laughs> you're hitting that impeller, and it, all of a sudden it goes out of balance. And if you imagine your washing machine, when you put too much water in it and it shakes, you imagine something that's rotating at 7,000 RPM. It's not just shaking, it's virtually taking off. And so, MBR is great, but we need to wait a wee bit for the technology. If it, goes wrong, it goes wrong. if it goes wrong, it goes catastrophically yeah. wrong. And it's really, really expensive. So my previous employee, I worked for in the evaporator system. To me, used MBR. I loved the MBR. Super efficient, super cost effective. But when it went wrong, it went catastrophically wrong. So if MBR is an example to run an evaporator, you do it without trusting a tiny amount of steam. So two bar of steam would run an MBR. If the MBR breaks and you need to go to thermal vapor recompression, you have to shut the still because you need 10 bar of to run the evaporator. So, mechanical vapor recompression, super efficient, super expensive, but when it goes wrong, it goes very well. TVR, much simpler, much more cost effective, and much less problematic. This is like the movies, Jack. Aha! Touche. I hope not. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is number four warehouse. We've got eight warehouses like this. All warehouses are traditional Dunnish style. There is no steel racks. There's no palletization, uh, which is something that pleased me greatly uh, when I came here uh, way back in 2006. Uh, capacity for the warehouses is 22,500. At the moment, we're probably sitting about 21, but that doesn't concern me because the balance of ins and outs works very, very well. Everything that's filled into, filled for Babbler single malt, bigger burden, is fully matured on site here before it goes down to Airdrie uh, for bottling. The vast majority is uh, American Barrel, mm -hmm. um, some Hogsheads, and you know to a much lesser extent, um, Sherry's. So to stress that every single malt that comes from Bor Blair is matured here. Yeah, for single malt, yeah. 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 And for Blair, how much, what's the split between single malt and percent of the Blair? Malcolm, you can answer that question, I'm sure. <laughs> you need the stock guys, I can't tell you, I mean, it's not, it's not a secret, I just but do not hold that figure in my head well, per distillery. So for, uh, for single malt, it's the last figure I've seen was about 16%. But we also use it in blends like Hanky Bannister and what have you. Yeah. So we, yeah, we like to, yeah. so it's, you know, across our brands it, it's used, but I, I mean, as I say, it's not 
I can't okay. tell you. It's just I don't I don't have the figure. Um, and the other thing is a group for us with our shareholder. They're very keen to lay down for future. So actually, we have a lot. And I mean a lot of very old bulb layers in the 30, 40, I think we're nearly heading for a 60 year old. So one of the things we'll be doing in the next few years is releasing more high age because the one advantage of having a patient shareholder is they're happy. Not We don't have to push to sell it all today. We're not here to raise money and start products to you know pay the cash flow for our new distillery. This is all about building for the future. So we actually are laying down a lot, especially on Barblet, a lot of stock which we can release at certainly 25, 35, 45, 55 years old. So that's an area you're going to see. I think our oldest Barblet is 58 years old, I think, just now. I wasn't going to tell anybody that, Malcolm. Right, okay. <laughs> our oldest Barblet is over 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, the, the, you know for, for us, there's a... Um, that's an area I think that we will look to do to more on. So we, we've got a really enviable, and not just at Barblet, all the sites, uh, shareholders own the business for over 21 years. And actually one of their issues is they believe that as a company based in Asia and Asia growing and premiumizing, that it makes sense to lay down a lot more whiskey. So even if you're saying, what do we use for our distilleries or distillates just now, it's X, but actually we're laying down a lot to go into Barblet in the future as Barblet grows. So that's the other thing from us. So we're happy to hold the stock and our shareholder and the business has no worries with holding more assets in terms of our Scotch whisky. So from our side, we'll continue to hold a lot more stock so we can actually grow into that consumer base as it develops around the world. And we certainly see Asia as a, obviously a, a big area for us going forward. And I, I think India as well, as we all know, is another huge powerhouse market that will look to to drink higher and better uh, aged whiskey. So for that, we're investing in the future.